Hello everyone! This video is entitled Elements and the Periodic Table. In this lecture, I will discuss how the periodic table was developed, the brilliant person responsible for its earliest version, why elements in the table are arranged the way they are, and the important role electrons play in the stability of those elements. Okay, let's get started. In the mid-1800s, when chemists started to catalog elements into charts, they began to recognize patterns in the properties and behavior of many elements. Take these five elements, for example. Each of them shares many physical and chemical properties, but differ from one another by atomic mass. These similarities prompted scientists to search for a rationale that could explain how these elements were connected and to their beckoning call came Dmitry Mendeleev, a chemistry superhero. Mendeleev was a brilliant Russian-born scientist that chose to take on the daunting task of determining the relationship between the known elements. At the time, there were only 63 known elements that early chemists had organized into a chart by increasing atomic mass. This is of course due to the fact that electrons and protons had not yet been discovered. But Mendeleev was unsettled because the organized chart failed to explain the similarities certain elements shared. In his pursuit to provide a reason for the shared properties of elements, he began to rearrange the elements so that those with similar properties could be grouped together. He kept the known elements in order of increasing atomic mass, but placed them into columns in relation to the properties they share. This resulted in a table of elements, organized so that the elements with similar properties were positioned in the same column. Because Mendeleev's arrangements highlighted the periodic or repeating patterns of properties, his table was called a periodic table. But that's not the end of Mendeleev's story. He then used the repeating pattern of properties in his table to predict the existence of elements that had not yet been discovered. He left blank spaces in the table as placeholders to represent those unknown elements. Mendeleev was so convinced that his placeholder elements existed that he correctly assigned each one of them with an atomic weight and physical properties. Within 15 years, many of his missing elements were discovered conforming to the basic characteristics that Mendeleev had recorded. It was the accuracy of his predictions that led to the broad acceptance of his periodic table by the scientific community. This is a typed version of Dmitry Mendeleev's periodic table. You can see how he organized the elements into columns by increasing atomic mass. You can also see the elements he predicted indicated by question marks. This element here is now called technetium. Technetium is so rare that it could not be isolated until it was synthesized in a cyclotron in 1937. That's almost 70 years after Mendeleev had predicted its existence, 30 years after his death. To honor his achievements, scientists named element 101 Mendelevium in 1963. The modern periodic table is a modification of the arrangements first proposed by Mendeleev. Based on new evidence and scientific discovery, the elements on the periodic table are now arranged according to atomic number. Scientists have developed a rule that formally recognizes the repeating patterns Mendeleev began to outline in his work. They call it periodic law. The law states that the chemical and physical properties of the elements repeat in a regular, periodic pattern when they are arranged according to their atomic number. Below are a few elements from the first column of the periodic table. Chemists have discovered that all these elements are soft, malleable, ductile, and very reactive with water and group 18 elements. This is perfectly in line with the periodic law. The establishment of periodic law has led us to understand that the periodic trends resulting from the organization of elements by their atomic number are linked to the way in which electrons occupy and fill energy levels. 
electrons move around the atomic nucleus in fixed restricted regions of space. These volumes of space in which electrons may be found are known as energy levels. There is a limit to the number of electrons that can occupy each energy level. A maximum of two electrons can occupy the first energy level. A maximum of eight electrons can occupy the second energy level. And every other energy level can hold eight or more electrons. The structure of the periodic table is entirely based on the recurring patterns of reactivity in elements. These patterns are displayed in periods, which are rows on the periodic table, and groups, which are columns. The reactivity of elements is tied to their number of electrons. The elements in period one have electrons in only one energy level, while the elements in period two have electrons in two energy levels. This pattern applies to all seven periods. And so, an element's period number is the same as the number of energy levels within the element that hold electrons. All the elements within a primary group have the same number of electrons in their outermost energy level. These are known as valence electrons. These are the electrons that are used in chemical bonding. They are also the electrons that are responsible for the chemical behavior of elements. And with that, we arrive to a review of the octet rule. The octet rule is a very general rule that enables us to predict how atoms will create chemical bonds to form compounds. The rule is based on observations of how atoms behave in the real world. It is an undefined rule with numerous exceptions, but it works very well for some of the most common elements scientists use on a regular basis. The rule basically states that when elements have eight electrons in their outermost energy level, they are considered stable with a full octet. The only elements that naturally display these characteristics are noble gases. Noble gases are the only stable elements on the periodic table. Located in group 18, these elements are non-reactive due to their full octet of electrons. Now, when atoms have fewer than eight electrons in their outermost energy level, they react with other atoms to form stable compounds. They do this to achieve full octets. Take metals, for example. It is easier for metals to lose electrons and become positively charged ions to achieve full octets. Let's look at this metal atom, for example. It has one electron in its outermost energy level. Now it's obviously going to lose this one electron instead of gaining seven electrons to get a full octet. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking if it loses this one electron, then its outermost energy level will be empty. In fact, if it loses this one electron, this will no longer be its outermost energy level. For it to be an energy level, it must have an electron. And so by losing this one electron, its new outermost energy level will be this level here. And of course, this level has eight electrons. And so metals will oftentimes lose the electrons in their outermost energy level to expose a new level that is far more stable. For nonmetals, it is much easier to gain electrons and become negatively charged ions to achieve full octets. And so for this nonmetal, you have seven electrons in its outermost energy level, and so obviously it makes sense to gain one electron. So let's see this in action. This metal wants to lose one electron, and so this nonmetal will gain it. And when we see this happen, you can see that the nonmetal has gained the one electron and the metal has lost that empty outer orbital. Now, both of these atoms are now fully stable because both of these atoms have full octets. Now, it's important to keep in mind that because this, this metal here has lost one electron and electrons are negative, it's now overall positive. And because this nonmetal has gained one electron and that electron being negative, 
this nonmetal has now an overall negative charge. And so we've created two ions here. We've created a positive ion and a negative ion. Now, the positive charge of this metal and the negative charge of this nonmetal are actually going to attract each other. And so that's why we form compounds, because the positive and negative charge connect, creating a new ionic compound. In fact, the compound that's formed here is sodium fluoride. Okay, so let's review a few of the concepts I discussed in this lecture so far. Now, we know that groups are columns on the periodic table, and you can see that there are 18 columns. Each column represents a selection of elements that react very similarly to one another, as Mendeleev predicted. There are eight primary groups on the periodic table that really reflect this repeating pattern of reactivity. The eight primary groups are group one, group two, and groups 13 through to 18. The groups in the center of the periodic table, groups three to 12, are called the transitional elements and are not considered primary groups because they do not obey the octet rule. To emphasize that groups 13 through to 18 are among the primary groups, scientists have assigned an alternate designation for each of these groups. Let's zoom in to take a better look. If you look directly underneath the group number for each of these columns, you'll notice that there's a Roman numeral followed by the letter A. These Roman numerals represent the alternate designation of each of these groups. For group 13, the Roman numeral is 3, and so this group is also called group 3A. For group 14, the Roman numeral is 4, and so this group is also called group 4A. If we jump to group 18, the Roman numeral is 8, and so this group is also called group 8A. And so the eight primary groups are group one, group two, group 3A, 4A, 5A, 6A, 7A, and group 8A. Now, what's amazing about these group numbers is that they also represent the number of electrons in the outermost energy level of the elements in the columns they represent. So the elements in group one um, known as the alkali metals, all have one electron in their outermost energy level, and that's what they want to lose to become stable. While the elements in group 2, known as the alkaline earth metals, all have two electrons in their outermost energy level that they must lose to become stable. If we jump to group 3A, you'll notice that every element in this column has three electrons in its outermost energy level that they want to lose. Now remember, it's easier to lose three electrons rather than to gain five electrons to become stable. The elements in group 4A, on the other hand, have four electrons in their outermost energy level. And so they can either gain four electrons or lose four electrons. In this situation, elements are much more likely to share electrons, but more on that later. Now, the elements in group 5A to 7A are nonmetals, and they will gain electrons rather than lose electrons to become stable. The elements in group 5A have five electrons in their outermost energy level, and so they of course will gain three electrons rather than lose five electrons to become stable. The elements in group 6A have six electrons in their outermost energy level, and so they will gain two electrons to become stable. And the elements in group 7A, known as the halogens, have seven electrons in their outermost energy level, and they will gain one electron to become stable. Which brings us to the group 8A elements. These are the noble gases. These elements have eight electrons in their outermost energy level, and so they have full octets and are very stable. These elements will not gain or lose electrons and that is why noble gases are very unreactive. And so now we are really starting to put together why all the elements in the same group or column on the periodic table have almost identical properties. 
If the loss or gain of electrons is what determines when and how elements react, it makes sense that elements that have the same number of electrons to gain or lose will have very similar properties. Okay, so let's talk about charges. It's incredibly important to remember that every atom on the periodic table is presented in its neutral state. That means that the atom on the periodic table has the exact same number of electrons as it does protons. Now, if an atom were to lose electrons, it would then create a situation where the atom has more protons than it does electrons, giving the atom an overall positive charge. But if the atom were to gain electrons, then it would have more electrons than it does protons, giving the atom an overall negative charge. Let's see this in action. Take sodium, for example. Sodium has 11 electrons and 11 protons. Because the electrons are negatively charged and the protons are positively charged, the charges in this atom cancel out, putting it into a neutral state. But if sodium were to lose the one electron it has in its outermost energy level, it would now have 10 electrons and 11 protons. Because the charges of 10 electrons will only cancel out the charges of 10 protons, the atom will be left with the charge of the remaining proton. And this is why sodium develops an overall charge of one positive when it loses its valence electron. It is also why every element in group one will end up having a one positive charge when it reacts. Each of these um, will lose the one electron in its outermost energy level and develop a one positive charge. Now, if we look at chlorine, on the other hand, it has 17 electrons that cancel out the charges of 17 protons. But chlorine will gain one electron in a reaction to become stable, and so it will end up having 18 electrons to its 17 protons. That means that the charge of one electron will not be cancelled out, leaving chlorine with an overall negative charge. And of course, the same exact process will happen to each of the elements in group 7a when they react. That explains why the elements in each group develops the charge assigned to them. Group 6a elements will gain two electrons when they react, and so they will end up with a two negative charge. While the elements in group two will lose two electrons when they react and it'll be left with a overall two positive charge. So now that you have a better understanding of the periodic table and how and why elements react, it's important to reiterate that noble gases in group 18 are the only elements that exist as individual atoms in nature because they are unreactive. These atoms do not have to form compounds to form stable arrangements for their electrons. So the reason being, chemists believe that having a full outer energy level must be the very stable electron arrangement that these atoms need to stay in isolated states. So it's incredibly important that you understand atoms react so that they can have stable electron arrangements. They react so that they can create this octet of electrons. And so the reactivity of elements is completely based on their need, their want to get to that octet. And so actually every atom on the periodic table is effectively trying to get to the stable arrangement of electrons that noble gases already have. So when atoms have eight electrons in their outermost energy level, two for helium, uh, they are said to have stable octets, which represent a very stable electron arrangement. And with this slide, I essentially conclude this lecture. I hope you understood everything I discussed in this lecture. Thank you for listening. All the best.